A real pleasure tonight to have Colleen Hurst. I'm just going to read a little bit about her background. Colleen is a clinical psychologist and family therapist with over 30 years of industry experience. Some of her expertise, areas of expertise are cognitive behavioural therapy, solution-focused brief therapy, narrative therapy and interpersonal therapy. And she works with a wide range of issues, including depression, anxiety, panic disorders, phobias, traumas, domestic violence, addiction, sexuality, sexual abuse, grief, parenting issues, relationship and work-related stresses. I think you must be very tired. <laughs> um, lots of experience across many fields. We know we've had Colleen to speak many times here and she's always been fantastic, always given us real insights that have been practical and yet thoroughly based in practice. And tonight we're covering that rather sticky issue, which uh, covers everything from personal freedom and freedom of speech through to the amount of time that you spend following up with your social contacts and uh, the other things that you might do with your time other than look at a screen. So would you please join me in welcoming Colleen to talk on managing social media. Thank you. Very welcome. braving the weather and the traffic to be here. We're going to talk about a really important issue and we've got an hour and a half or an hour and 15 um, to cover this. But before I start, I'm sure I'm talking to a group where nobody here would spend more than two hours screen time a day. Like, I know none of you would. None of you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is check a screen, your phone, maybe even before you get out of bed. I know none of you would do that. None of you, before you go to bed at night, would be looking at a screen and none of you would have a TV or an iPad or an iPhone in your bedroom. So I know that I'm talking to a group who've got those simple rules down pat. Look, and I jo I'm, I'm joking a little bit with that because... Some of us are caught up in some of those patterns, and we're going to talk tonight about how to manage some of that. So the first thing that I want to talk about is um, just some, some basic stats about, about the internet, and then I want to talk about some of the positives, because it actually is this marvellous, amazing resource. And if we like it or not, it's here to stay. So I think the better attitude is how do we make this work? Then I want to talk about what are some of the concerns. And there are some really, 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 really big ones. And then the last little bit is, um, well, not the last little bit, but what are some healthy practices that we can put in place um, for our families to manage this? Because the growth of media, internet, is just going to keep on growing exponentially. There's also some handouts that, you've, that you would have picked up on the way in that have got some really useful websites on them, um, particularly for educating ourselves and our children, um, some information about cyberbullying and sexting and who to report that to, some information from federal police. There's also a site that I, I don't know if it's on there, Digital License by the Alana and Madeline Foundation. It's a great little website where for, um, at a school, for $10, you can actually teach kids cyber safety and smart, healthy practices. And as a parent, you can sign up for $30. I shouldn't be plugging it, but it's just, it's a nice little resource that you can go through with your children learning some basic safety stuff on the internet. The internet's grown so, so fast, and we're really struggling to keep up with it. I think there's, um, as of two, February 2017 this year, 186 billion monthly users on Facebook, 123 billion daily users on Facebook. Now here's the scary one, 83 billion fake profiles out there. 83 billion fake profiles. Every day, 300 million photos are going up online, every day. And so many of these photos are being put up by kids and teenagers not understanding the digital shelf life, it's indefinite that these photos have, they never go away. So things that our eight-year-olds are posting online in their fake profiles, 
can actually impact on their career path and jobs that they're applying for, um, their digital reputation, that the foundations of that can start being formed at a very young age. So it's all a little bit challenging. So here's the key. I'm going to start and finish with this because I think this catches everything. The three C's of resilient digital citizens. And it catches everything. The first one, contact, content, and conduct. The first one, contact. Who, who are we talking to on the internet? Who has access to our computers? Who's hacking in? Who has our passwords? But you know, the bigger thing with contact, I think, is how much contact are you having with your children? <laughs> while they're browsing the internet? How connected are you? How much do you know about what it is that they're doing? And yes, we do need to know their passwords, but so many young people have fake profiles. Some of us have more than one profile. So it's very difficult to keep up with what's happening for our kids. So contact. We need to know who our children are talking to, but we also need to stay in touch with them. The second one is content. Is it safe? Is it, is it valuable? Is it appropriate? Is it going to help in their develop, development? What is it that they're looking at? What is it that we're looking at? Are we spending five hours a day flicking through funny cat videos? Is that okay that our kids are doing that? Because at least they're quiet. Digital babysitters are a great invention. They're not healthy for anybody though. And conduct. So that's their behavior online. What are they posting? Cyberbullying is alive and well. Are they just being a spectator, the bystander? Because the bystander is the person who maybe they haven't done the bullying, but they're happy to be one of the people liking or passing it on or making some a comment about it, as well as being bullied, being the bully or being the bystander. So we also need to manage our conduct. How are we behaving in the family home with our kids? How are we behaving on the internet? What are we role modeling for our kids? So I think those three really catch what we're talking about. Tablets and social media, some of us might remember when um, I don't know, when there used to be things like phones, like phone boxes, phone booths. Um, some people here might have had one of those telephones with the dial, those circles, and everyone in the family, like you might not remember, and you had to line up at home because there was only one phone in the house. And, you know, it's the same era when everyone used to post Christmas cards to each other. Like, that's a relic from days gone by. So this has happened really quickly. Brief history. The very first PC was 1972. The first Apple was 76. World Wide Web in the 90s. Suddenly smartphones hit the scene in 2000. Facebook 2004. iPhones 2007. Samsungs 2009. iPads and tablets 2010. It's happened so quickly. And then the first International Congress on Internet Addiction happened in 2014. Suddenly looking at, and this is when recorded deaths were starting to be recorded from internet abuse, people spending too much time. And um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how it can impact physically. So our teens and tweens. Now the legal age is 13. So kids under 13 shouldn't have social media accounts anyway. Intel did a study in Australia and they looked at, I think it's 64% of girls, 36% um, of boys un between eight and 14, eight and 12, sorry, actually have social media accounts. Now, the problem with research like this is we know that it's always an under-reporting because some kids just don't want to own up to it. So we know that a lot of kids that are quite young actually have social media accounts. And 75% of parents say, I'm not saying that they don't, but they say, yes, I monitor everything my kids do online. And the other problem is so many of our teens change their online behaviour when their parents are around anyway. So parents don't really know what's going on. 70% say they hide their activity. Now remember, this stuff is under-reported. So some kids aren't going to put their hand up and say, yes, they're doing it. Now I'm not saying that it's any of your kids, but you know, there would be a few of the 183 billion monthly Facebook users who are doing some of this. So the other thing is tweens in this study would say, no, the most terrible thing is someone hacking my private stuff and getting into my account. But 29%, 30%, I think it's more than that, share their passwords with each other. Boyfriends and girlfriends know each other's passwords. Best friends know each other's passwords. In our groups know each other's passwords. Brothers and sisters know each other's passwords. So our passwords are fairly accessible. 
and get passed on. So we need to teach our kids how sacred and how secure we need to keep our passwords. We need to teach our kids how to stay protected. We're going to talk about that. So 38% is more than that. Reported fake profiles, 37% um, hide parents, hide from their parents, the activity from parents. 11% will say that they've met up with a stranger that they met online. We're talking tweens and teens. We're talking under 18-year-olds will say they've met up with a stranger online and many parents don't know about it. I have quite a few clients, current and past, who have got into terrible situations meeting up with strangers. The 65-year-old guy who said he was 14. The 28-year-old guy who said he was 16. Now the problem, if some of our kids, and this has happened with a few clients of mine, where if some of this grooming happens online, once our daughters turn 16, and the person who's vowed and declared undying love turns up on the scene, they can leave and the police can't stop it. At 16, they can go with this person and it causes great angst and distress. So we don't want that happening. We want to we wanna be so savvy and educated in how to manage this stuff so this isn't going to be one of our kids. Now, digital parenting is still parenting. For me, when the internet came on board, my kids are in their 20s and 30s now, so it was massive catch-up trying to understand. When I look at this, I think sometimes some of my behaviour was a little bit passive, which uh, permissive, which actually isn't a good place to be, because I trust my kids. I know you'll do the right thing, I trust you. You know, they go to church, they're involved in school, they study hard, you know, they're nice kids. I trust that you'll do the right thing on the internet. The problem is the other 186 billion people might not. The other sort of parenting is the uninvolved parent. Oh, kids will learn. They'll learn from their mistakes. This is good education for them. Or we've got the authoritarian parent who, my rules, my time, the way I say it, you'll do what I say, or I'll take all of your access to the internet away rather than teaching what's safe behaviour. Because I think when we do some of that authoritarian parenting, kids are going to go underground. And it's a really dangerous environment for our kids. For... Okay, so the positives, it's not all doom and gloom. The internet's amazing, social connection. When one of my daughters lived in England for two years, it was fantastic. Just the photos and the free contact and phone calls. It, it's a wonderful medium, catching up with friends you haven't seen for ages, friends who live all around the world. It's a wonderful form of social connectedness and it's easy and it's instant communication. I could send a message to one of my sons or daughters right now and I'd get a message back because they're young and they carry their phones around with them everywhere they go. So it's wonderful that we can have this access to one another. So it's kind of, kind of, bringing us together in a very isolated sort of a way. And it's kind of changing our culture and how we relate. But real-time news and information, like it's great that we know what's actually going on in the world right now. We're not doing catch-up a couple of weeks later. So it's, it's fantastic. Opportunities for business and connecting and advertising and profiling and getting known. And then just the fun and the enjoyment of learning and discovering and being entertained. Like there are really valuable things. And we know even the communication with emailing, homework and assignments online. Like it, there really are definite benefits around this but we have to put a boundary around it. I've spoken to quite a few IT people who say there actually is no actual guaranteed way to firewall and protect computers. There's no way to stop people hacking in. So there's a very big onus on how we teach our kids to stay safe. So I've actually doubled the number of concerns and I did that on purpose. So I've come up with five positives and 10 concerns. And we need to look at these. We're just going to whip through these. So the information overload. Now, this is quite scary because kids can type in silly words and they can spell things differently. With the click of you know, boobs and sex or looking up household products to kill myself with or um, how to avoid um, people thinking I'm not, not putting weight on. There's how to self-harm and not be found out. So there are so many websites that our kids can actually access and it's flood of data and sometimes quite inappropriate content. I remember one time I was doing 
a presentation on um, sexual intimacy in couple relationships. And I'm a family therapist. And I thought, oh, I just want some diagrams. So I was looking at hand-drawn um, graphic genitalia. Some, really, I just didn't want any rude pictures. And I had child porn flash up on my screen in amongst all of the photos and images. So I just thought, I'll skip it. <laughs> we'll just talk about it. So if I was trying not to find that data, and I still found it. So our kids are being exposed to things. It's actually quite serious around the, the sexual content because we don't want our kids being exposed to sexualized information because sex hormones start secreting in our brain too young. And so some of our sexual development starts happening at the wrong time when bodies aren't actually ready for that. So we can have um, the sexually explicit material and the porn, which the porn industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, wants more and more people signing up for it. And it's rather attractive to young people. Well, it's rather attractive to lots of people, but for young people who don't understand the fullness of the impact and the danger that that can be. And then there's lots of video pictures and games and, and cruelty and methods of torture and violence and killing that our kids can have access to. So don't do that um, permissive parenting where I trust them, they'll be okay. Don't, I'm sure some of us have wandered into websites that we never originally intended to get to, but one click led to another click led to another click. And then we've got sites promoting all of that negative behavior. And you can almost Google anything, you look for it and you're gonna find it there. Privacy and safety, so not everything on the internet is true. Now we know that, um, many people, can be pretending to be anyone they want. Some of us know this picture. On the, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Like that's, that picture's been around for quite a while. Talking about how we can present ourselves to be anyone that we want. And our kids are much more vulnerable to believe what's actually happening. Quite a um, horrific story happened in America in May 2014. There was um, a website, uh, there's a, a, a digital reality, cyber reality, um, around a, um, a horror character called Slender Man. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, and in 2014, two 12-year-old girls lured one of their friends into the woods and tried to kill her. They stabbed her 19 times because they believed that Slender Man was real and they were trying to get his approval. And they thought that this was the way to do it. And the police found them trying to find their way into the forest where Slender Man lived. Now, they're still in jail awaiting trial because no one can really work out how did this happen, that they actually believed this was a real thing that was happening. But it was all just fantasy on the internet. Now, these girls were having unbridled access to internet and to some of these sites with parents going, they'll learn, they'll be fine, I trust them, nothing bad will happen. So the other thing is selfies. I think it's 136,000 selfies every minute. 136,000 photos, sorry, every minute going online. And there is a proliferation of rude pictures. And there is a whole lot of bullying and sexting that happens. The whole issue with sexting is if, if, if somebody, if one of your girls, for instance, is coerced into uploading a, a partially naked, naked, compromising photo of herself, she'll be charged with child pornography. Now, even if she's been bullied into that or coerced into that, if she's put that information online, she gets into trouble for that. I have a couple of young people who are on the sex offenders list because of photos Boy and girl have a fight. Boy's really dirty because the girl's dropped her. Boy puts photos of them being intimate onto the internet. Now, that's a criminal offence. And it stays there forever. Even if you um, can get the first server to remove the, the photo, if that's been forwarded on and on and on. That stays out there forever. Um, and online grooming, online grooming is, is alive and well. Some of the clients I've seen, um, it's definitely not this school, but some of the pages and pages and pages and pages um, of contact that's happened in school, um, 
in different classes but because of internet access, because everyone's on their iPads and computers. Um, and I've had to go through some of the, the data, like when the police have been investigating, um, trying to understand at what points what had happened and had sex happened because this person was a lot older um, than the 14-year-old. She was 14, 15, 16 is when she finally left. And that's when the parents found reams, reams of this information. So we need to teach our kids, don't accept re friend requests from people that you don't know. Don't do that. Don't let other people have access to your iPad. Don't lend your digital devices to other people unless everything's shut down and everything's password protected. Um, yes. And cyberbullying. I've had um, a few clients who have had great distress um, with cyberbullying because it's, it's that bullying that you can be at home in your bed and you're still being bullied. You can be away on holidays with your family and you're still being bullied. And there's something very potent about a screen that's sitting there staring at you, saying these glaring terrible things, horrible things and horrible photos and people laughing and commenting and people then seeing hundreds and hundreds of comments coming up about them. Trolling is a different sort of bullying. It's where I'll just start posting all sorts of things about you. I might not be sending anything to you, but I'm just going to create mayhem for you and say all sorts of horrible things about you. If our kids are being bullied, we need to do something about it. And the website, Think You Know, um, this, it's a very good website. And if bullying's happening, we need to stop it straight away and we need to report it straight away. So we need to stop. Our kids need to know stop, log off, don't keep looking. It's very seductive, it's very addictive. You want to see what's happening, even though you're sitting there crying and crying. It's like some of the horror websites. Kids might be absolutely terrified, but they'll keep watching it. So we need to teach our kids stop straight away, block it, block, record it, and then talk to someone. And I think bullying needs to be reported. I think we condone it. We, we get stuck in that bystander effect. You know, it's not that bad. Kids are just saying a few things. No, kids, kids can end up in very bad situations um, if they're being bullied and there's no one there to protect them. So some Aussie studies will say that over 50%. Some say it's between 15 and 50%. But the way I see studies is they're always underreported. So what we know is a significant number of children. And let's say it is 50%, let's say it's 40%. Even if it's 10%, that means 10% of the people here in this room have a child who's being bullied or been bullied. So the stats are significant. We're not talking one or 2%. The other problem with bullying, our kids could be the ones doing the bullying, thinking that it's funny. Funny to make fun of someone, that photo of someone when they fell down, that photo of someone when they were throwing up. So we need to monitor, we need to know what our kids are doing online. And the peak age between 10 and 15, I actually think it's younger than that, but some of our young kids aren't talking about that. And yes, the three roles, and sometimes the bystander, that is the role that's allowing it to proliferate, is we might see it, but we don't do anything about it. Online versus offline self. It's an interesting thing. We're kind of becoming more connected and more isolated at the same time. On the internet, we can post our best photos and we can craft and create this digitally mediated, disembodied version of self. And we might be having the most terrible day and then I'll get a post from someone who's, yay, oh, I just had this great cup of coffee, my life's so good. And they post the photo and we look at it and go, oh, I never have a coffee like that. And so I whip out and I make a nice cup of tea and I take a photo and go, oh, I've got a tea, it's great. You know, and we're hoping that we're going to get likes. I remember when one of my daughters graduated from um, uni and her now husband came with her to the ceremony and they, um, as we're walking to the restaurant to celebrate, she's uploading photos and we're walking and the two of them are on their phones and then we get to the restaurant and they basically were spending, wow, that's 17 likes, that's 25 likes, that's 30 likes and I'm going, stop, put your phones away, stop, no, 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 I just want to see how many likes. 
And so it, it feeds into our egos. I have adult clients in their 40s who argue, I kid you not, a few weeks ago, arguing about not liking each other's stuff enough and that other people like her stuff more than you like my stuff. And you should be like, and I told them that they have to have a digital detox and turn Facebook off because it was creating relationship conflict because there wasn't enough likes going backwards and forwards. So our self-esteem, what matters is being changed. So we might have good connection, but we're actually becoming more isolated because we're putting up this phony version of self. How many people put their worst photos on? You know, they've got a bad hair day and it's a lousy day. We don't post those things. We tend to craft photos. You know, there's something around now called digital, uh, Facebook depression because everyone else has a better life than me. and Everyone else has got great things happening. My life's lousy. Problem is, I'm putting fantastic, amazing things up too. So you're thinking, I have a better life than you. And our kids are trying to live this real world and a fake world. I think the average number of times for looking at Facebook is 14 times a day. The problem with our teens is something like 80% have continuous connection. So they're not even turning it off. In the middle of the night, they can wake up and check and have a chat. Now, particularly when they think they have found love, um, it can be all night, backwards and forwards on the um, internet. So we see a drop in socialising. We have this mediated self-image. Now, don't forget, everybody's watching as well. So if you're on the internet, you're looking for car tyres, and you find the tyres that you want, and then next week you're online, you're just checking something, and all these ads for car tyres will keep coming up. You know, how do they know? Who's watching? So we are being watched. Our kids are being watched. Big Brother is watching. This is important for our older teens. Um, one of... The first time this happened, a woman came to see me because she was afraid that her husband was somehow following her, that he knew everything that she was doing, that she was, she was being monitored and followed. And so we called the police and the police said that we had to get her phone, we had to wrap it in foil, we had to put it in a Milo tin and then we had to take it to the police station because it had a malicious stalker app on it. Now back in the day, this is probably five years ago, if you... If a boyfriend downloads an app like that. They have access to everything on your phone, can activate the camera, can activate the, the hearing on the phone. Um, back in the day, you could know because it used up lots of your data. But apparently now, they're much more sophisticated and you can hardly see the data being used. Now, I'm not very good on the internet, but I thought, I wonder if I could buy an app like that. I wonder how hard it would be. And I think it was three or four clicks and there it was, ready for me to buy which of course I didn't buy. I was like, oh, shut it down, I'm sure it's not legal. But this is an issue for our kids if they have a controlling someone in their life, wanting to know where they are, who they're seeing, what they're doing, how long you were gone for. And it, the police, it's quite illegal, but the police are quite aware of this happening. So we need to monitor that for our children as well when they're starting to date. And we've talked about our digital reputation because that stays with us forever. You know, it's interesting. I think about some of the silly things, stupid emails that I've sent, and I think the day will come with my grandchildren, maybe even my great-grandchildren, where they'll be sitting around and think, hey, why don't we see the emails that Nana sent 50 years ago? And I'm sure there will be means to be able to access all of that stuff. One day it's going to be codified and filed and, and we'll be able to access it. So there's a thought for all of us as well, <laughs> that everything we've ever done on the internet is all accessible. And one day, somebody might, if not already, might be peeking at it. Oh yes, our digital self and our um, real self starts to blur. Our kids also need to know that everything that they've ever texted, if they're on a plan, can all be downloaded. That's happened a few times in my counselling practice where um, someone's having an affair and texting someone that they shouldn't be texting. And all of that information can be retrieved quite simply and quite quickly. So our kids need to know that as well. If they think they have um, anonymity when they're sending texts, it's all recorded. Does this sound a bit scary? 
Okay, they are weapons of mass, dis mass distraction. Has anyone here ever been on the internet? Oh, ever gone into your room and you just want to check the weather? Or you just want to check your emails and then five hours later, uh-oh, how did that just happen? How did five minutes grow into 15, into 20? Now, for our kids, it's very easy for them to be distracted. They're going into study. Rates of study across the board have decreased as kids are spending more time browsing on the internet because it's there. And we get reinforcement and we get, um, we get lights and interaction and comments and we can flick the screen and so it's, it's ongoing stimulation for us. But it's actually stealing our concentration. And so very easy for us to waste our time on the internet as well. Sedentary lifestyle. I think the first recorded death was in 2001 um, and that was a suicide from a young guy who was dropped by someone in his game called EverQuest. Um, the next recorded internet death, I think, was in um, Taiwan. Uh, an, um, I think an 18-year-old guy who'd spent 50 hours non-stop on the internet and he, he died from exhaustion, dehydration. South Korea, 2015, um, another guy in his mid-20s. Now, these are just the recorded ones. And, and it's, again, from just collapsing, whole body shutting down. UK, deep vein thrombosis um, has been recorded from people sitting, playing games. Um, a lot of young people that I've seen will end up creating these lives, avatars, and playing games with people all over the world. So they develop these nocturnal vampire Dracula lifestyles where during the day they've shut down from life and their real life is now in this cyber world. That's where their real friends are. That's where real meaning happens. We'll talk about gaming addiction, but one of the classic things, if anyone here has someone who's addicted to online games, is you try and stop someone playing those games. The classic symptoms are violence and anger. Um, your, your young people might kick you, might want to punch holes in the wall, get vicious because you're taking their life away. It's a very real phenomenon, and those symptoms tend to be across the board. The gamers, the game companies, when they do research, they say about 2% of people are addicted to games. That was like when tobacco companies did research for smoking and said it only makes you more healthy. So when we look at general research, it's something like 23% of young people um, can be addicted to online gaming. So it's a significant number and we need to not get there. It's quite a difficult addiction to break. It's quite difficult to stop it. So let's just not go there. Carpal tunnel syndrome, that's pretty common. Obesity. People lose general fitness because we're spending so much more time sitting around and being mesmerised by twinkly bright lights. Um, um, Oh, I put obesity twice because it's such a big issue. Um, but eye strain, migraines. Um, sometimes after we've been on the internet for a long time, we'll almost feel like there's white noise in our prefrontal cortex. We feel foggy. We feel a little bit disoriented because we're being bombarded with electromagnetic radiation. Like, would we want to stand in electromagnetic radiation all day? Well, we do. And our brain is quite a delicate thing. It has the same voltage, about the same voltage as a fridge light. And so if we're bombarding this with, with radiation 24-7, we're all bathed in it right now, we've all got a phone somewhere, it's going to have an impact on us. So we need, and it's not about, let's not debate whether or not that's a problem. Um, I know when people were glued to their, when mobile phones first came out and everyone was glued to their phone, even in the shops, everywhere you went, because that was a bit of a status thing. Like when cigarettes came out, everyone had to smoke because it was so cool. And then there was this um, eruption of tumours that sat behind your ear. Now, the mobile phone companies did research and said, oh, no, that doesn't happen. My brother-in-law, he worked for, um, uh, he's an IT guy, IT consultant, was, um, and he developed a brain tumour about the size of an avocado seed. And his doctor, the neurosurgeon, said, no, it was inoperable. Charlie Teo did that surgery, and his comment was, it's a classic mobile phone tumour. I do these all the time. So he might have been making that up, but that's pretty significant. Now, this 
day and age, we tend to have um, hands-free phones, but where is that phone? <laughs> Where's that phone that if it's there all the time, maybe, possibly, could, maybe, cause a tumour? Is it in my pocket? Is it near my breast? Is it near my genital area? Like, where is that phone? So we also need to teach our kids we shouldn't be carrying our phone around. We shouldn't have it there all the time because it's emitting, um, our wireless devices are emitting electromagnetic radiation. We're going to talk more about what that can do as well. Sleep disturbances. Technology is keeping us all up at night. Because we've got bright lights, um, it's interrupting the secretion of melatonin. Melatonin is a chemical that helps us go to sleep. The bright lights, the photons are telling us, time to wake up, time to wake up. Time to wake up. The absolute worst thing we can do is to watch a screen in the hour before we go to bed. It includes TVs, iPads, phones, any screen. Now, it's not that it's a crime. It's just that it's more likely to make you not sleep well. So we need, we need to apply this as well um, because our smart TVs, we don't want to have something there in our bedrooms emitting pulses and keeping us awake. So we shouldn't have devices in the bedroom overnight. For our young, for our children, we should have rules and policies where everybody's iPads and iPhones go into a box. It can be a lock box if you're changing the rules and you haven't done it before. Um, or it goes into a cupboard in mum and dad's room. So we need to be teaching our kids, and it's not a punishment. It's just actually not healthy for them. And some kids will say, some adults will say, no, but I use my phone as an alarm clock. And then I say, buy an alarm clock. <laughs> so is it worth having the phone there, which is such a temptation? So we shouldn't have devices in the bedroom and we need to have good sleep hygiene, which means getting our kids, turning everything off, at this particular time, and this is time to go to bed. It's not the same reading Kindle in bed as reading a book. It's not the same. And if anyone has read Kindle in bed, you'll know you're not going to feel the same as if you've just read a book. Um, I think if you're reading something on Kindle, you'll probably read more than if you're reading a book, because if I read a book in bed, it puts me to sleep. That's why I like to read when I go to bed, because it helps me go to sleep. But if I'm looking at something that's talking to me, interacting with me, bright lights, it's actually going to make it harder for me to go to sleep. So these aren't habits that we want our kids to develop. Okay, internet addiction disorder. It encompasses many things. You know, online shopping is one of them. I used to be the eBay queen. Back in the day, I was addicted to eBay. But I broke that because now I do gum tree. Yes. No. Any of us, we can get hooked on looking at Pinterest. We can get hooked on um, gambling, on as well as gaming. We can get compulsively, well, blogging's a little bit old-fashioned now, but just needing to upload, and Facebook is probably one of the biggest ones, but excessive social networking. But all of this, internet addiction disorder isn't um, recognise that the DSM-5 came out in 2015, uh, 2013. Remember, the first International Congress for Internet Addiction was 2014. It came out a year later. So the DSM-5, it's got it as a, a sub-question mark, maybe possible internet um, use, internet abuse disorder, some fuzzy thing. The jury's out. Who knows if it's really a problem? So it's got some catching up to do. Part of um, the research, when people's little brains are put in through MRI machines to try and understand what is it that keeps us so addicted to screens and, and games and shopping and gambling and... and tablets and what is it? And it seems that in the middle of our brain, um, our reward centre, the pleasure centre, releases a, do a hit of dopamine, which is, makes us feel good. And it's very similar when somebody's gambling, whether they're winning or not, um, when somebody's using drugs. So sometimes our brain reacts in a very similar way. It's this reward. Now, the way an addiction works is there's two ways. The first one is we develop something called tolerance, which means we need more and more. 
we need more and more of it to get the same hit, to feel good. You know, we develop, I might have had one glass of wine, but then I need two, then I need three. I might have had one hour on the internet, now I need five, six. I need more to feel really good. I actually, that's one part of addiction. The other part of addiction, which I think is worse, is something called sensitization. You know, we're desensitized to something where it doesn't affect us anymore. We're sensitized to something where we just really want it. The tolerance is, I really need it, or I'm going to go through withdrawals. The sensitization is, I just really want it. I just really want that chocolate. I just really want that Krispy Kreme donut. I just, I'm going to get one. I'm going to buy one on the way home. I don't need it. I'm not having body withdrawals from it. But it's so right up there in my prefrontal cortex, front and centre. I'm not going to die if I don't look at my Facebook, but I'm so sensitised to it, I really need it. I need it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not going to hurt me. It's not illegal. It's not a drug. I just need to check, 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 check. Now I think that's the more dangerous one. Something else happens when we're growing, we're going to talk about brain development, is long-term repeated behaviour creates lifelong neurological change. That sounds like an addiction, doesn't it? Long-term repeated behaviour, doing it over and over and over again, creates lifelong neurological change. So my brain changes. The more I do something, the more I'll do it. The more I do it, the easier it is to do it. The more I do it and the easier it is to do, the more it starts feeling like it's part of me. It's part of my life. I know how to walk. I've done it all the time, all my life. Well, since I was like two. So long-term re repeated behaviour creates lifelong neurological change. It's called learning. That's the process of learning. That's how our brains work. That's how our brains learn anything, including our addictive behaviours. We learn by doing things over and over and over again. We also can learn new patterns by saying no over and over and over again. But it's a very hard to break an entrenched addiction like an internet addiction because the internet's everywhere. Because I can have access to it. The same way, if we want to change a behaviour, it's not going to happen overnight. You might send someone to counselling for a few sessions and that should fix them. They've done 10 sessions of CBT, so now they should have stopped their internet addiction. They shouldn't be gaming anymore. Our brain takes time to change. Has anyone here ever had one music lesson, for instance, and then put your CD out? Anyone ever had one lesson to learn Japanese, Chinese, French or foreign language? One lesson. And now you're fluent, you're writing books, you're a translator. The point is it takes time. You know it takes four months for about 0.7 of a millimetre of a dendrite. That's the cables that connect our brain cells, that create the pathways for new behaviour. So we know that changing any habit, whether it's good or bad, is going to take commitment for at least 12 to 18 months to actually start creating new patterns. So if our kids have developed, or we have developed, some internet addictive behaviours, you can change it 100%. You can manage that and turn it around. The problem is, it's going to be a bit hard, and it's going to take effortful behaviour and commitment. But we can turn it around. Our kids, if we've been that... Um, permissive parent and just trusted them and now they're gaming all night and they haven't been doing their study, it's going to take a little bit of time for them to turn that around. So us just getting cranky at them and telling them to stop is not going to help them change that behaviour. We have to do the hard yards to help them start learning new patterns of behaviour around internet health. So internet addiction. Oh, we can get a sort of euphoria. We feel so good, we feel in another world. All the problems of the world just fade away, like when you're gambling, like when you're drinking, like when you're looking at porn, like whatever the addictive behaviour is. And that's what it is, it makes us feel good. So that's why we keep going back to more and more. The other thing that catches some of us around internet addiction, um, I saw a mum this week who said, I'm so proud of my 18-month-old. She's just amazing. She can do so much on the iPad. She's better on the iPad than my mum. Like, she's really intelligent. <laughs> um, there was an article this week about three-year-olds being addicted to iPads. It's actually really dangerous for our kids to be using digital devices at 
that young age. I know there was a doctor's report out last year looking at how babies, when they're in their cot from newborn, should have an iPad in the cot so they can start getting used to some of this technology. Here's, here's a challenging way to look at it, but you know, I'm a psychologist. When I was at uni, you can train rats and pigeons to press buttons on a screen. <laughs> I don't know that that means they're going to be a professor at university. Like, there's that element as well. What are we teaching our kids? You press that button and a bell rings. You press that and then a light flashes. Is that really teaching? I don't know what that's really teaching. And nobody really knows because iPads have only been around since 2009. Like, it's all new technology. So we need to be careful of giving our kids access to this stuff because their brains aren't there yet. And we'll talk, oh, we're almost there to talk about it. Ah, so internet behavior, checking, checking, checking. Are you doing that? Don't you do it. Has anyone checked their phone while they've been here tonight? Anyone checked Facebook while they've been here tonight? Good. And would you admit to it? Because we under-report. <laughs> no. So we're purchasing in-game items. When Pokemon, mm, Pokemon Go, when that all of a sudden exploded and people were spending, it's free, but you can buy all of these special adaptation things. Kids were spending, and adults, hundreds of dollars into buying these online things. And in some of these um, sites, Second Life is one. You can buy homes and holidays and cars and, and you have to spend your money to buy a pretend car online. You spend money to buy a pretend holiday, but people spend the money. The other thing, how this can absolutely capture our thinking. This is an adult, a friend of mine. He met his one true love through a game called Second Life. And he, was, he came to meet me because he was getting ready to leave his wife and fly over to America so that he could be with his one true love because they'd had holidays and bought a house and got a dog on Second Life and they talked all the time and they had a great garden. It's fantasy and it's not real. He was about to leave and I said, don't do it. This isn't, it's fantasy. No, you don't understand. You don't understand. He sounded like a 15-year-old girl that I'd been seeing that same week. You don't understand. He really loves me. Now, the sad story for her is three years ago, she went with that guy and she has not come back. The good story for this guy is he didn't go because the woman online from Second Life is one true love who bought the house and the car and the dog said... Oh, I'm actually really doing a PhD at university on cyber fantasy. Thank you so much for contributing to my research. Have a nice life. Now, he was devastated. He was heartbroken because he felt like he'd been dumped by his one true love. And he was, he was absolutely consumed in the reality of it. Now, he's a grown man. How are our kids, especially our girls, if they're feeling isolated, they don't quite fit in, they're feeling like mum and dad don't understand them, they're, they're not as good as everyone else posts on Facebook, and then they find this person who says online, I've never met anyone like you. Every time I talk to you, I feel alive. You're the most beautiful girl in all of creation, etc., etc. And I've read some of these. It's, you know, it's Mills and Boone on steroids. But for a young, vulnerable girl, it's everything she wants to hear. And so it's very easy to make that true, to believe that's true. So we justify behaviour. Um, oh, yes, this is all of our internet gaming addictions. And I've seen a few. One of the fellows a few years ago who came first in Australia. And this is a few years ago, so you won't be able to identify him second I think Minecraft, War of Worlds, I forget which one. Um, second in America in the great big contest, he'd punched holes in the walls, tried to strangle his mother, tried to suffocate his mother, dropped out of school, stole money. Like a lovely young guy, a lovely young guy, but he was living in cyberspace. Okay. Oh, so gaming? We escape from reality, the, there's lots of feedback. You've got a team and you all work together. You feel like you belong, um, but it's, it's fantasy. You can create your avatar, be whoever you want to be. Um, you can immerse yourself completely in the gaming world. Um, and you've got friends who like you and the 
Phoning noobs, phoning is how, phoning noobs is where you totally obliterate your opponent, especially the newbies. So for a young vulnerable person, you get completely slammed, smashed, destroyed, and you'll never play a game again. It's quite nasty. So what's happening to her brain? Now this is where it gets really scary. For me as a psychologist, this is where it gets scary. Okay, so that's that when we get to teen years. So the way, we, when we're born, we have about 100 billion brain cells. They're not particularly connected up yet. And our brain, the way our brain grows is by growing connections. Now our brain runs on electricity, and so all of these fibre-like connections need to be linking up all of our neurons. That's how it works. So a clean slate, our brain can adapt if we're living in, um, a, in the desert, if we're living on a tropical island, if we're living in a city, if we're living in a village. Our brain has the capacity to wire up so we can adapt to pretty well any environment. It's, it's incredible, incredible design. So, and our brain tends to go in circuits, in cycles. So it's kind of every three years. So the first three years, like naught to three, massive wiring up is happening, and it's happening mainly around language. So we'll get this language explosion at around age three. The next cycle is around identity and belonging and fitting in. So that kind of peaks at around age six. And then the next one is around um, morality and right and wrong. Until we get to teenage, and we're going to talk about that one because it's, we're particularly vulnerable socially as a teen. Now, two things about how this can impact. When, when, when we've got little babies, we almost have this natural instinct for reciprocal behaviour. You know, it's coochie coochie and we all, oh, great, she smiled at me, wow, that was amazing. So we have this, this connection and it's reciprocity. Now, what, we've, what we understand with reciprocity is We've got this collection of cells here, and it's called the mirroring system. Some of us know it as the mirror neuron system, but it's a mirroring system. What that means is I upload a sense of you, and I upload what you're feeling and what you feel about me. Now, this is how I develop empathy. It's how I develop kindness. It's how I develop generosity. It's how I develop social ability. This wiring up for creating empathy, kindness, generosity only happens face to face. We actually have to have human contact. There's been about a 40% drop in rates of empathy in university students since the World Wide Web. Um, and part of the reason we think, apart from um, Facebook and social media largely all being about me, 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 everything's posting what I just did, like the whole world wants to know that what I had for breakfast, the other thing is we're not, having, we're not having this contact. So for kids who have something like reactive attachment disorder, these are kids who have been quite abused when they're little and been in and out of home care. When kids have no memory trace, where there's no memory trace of being loved and cared for, then our kids, the part in the brain that develops for kindness and empathy and compassion and conscience, right and wrong, it fails to develop. And so we have kids that seem like they have no conscience, reactive attachment disorder is at the very extreme. So our kids need face-to-face -face connecting. Remember the very first thing on the three C's for resilient digital people is contact. We have to have contact. It's not enough to text your kids or email your kids. We need to have the face-to-face -face contact. The other thing about these cycles is we also have critical windows in our brain. So some of our senses, and we have about up to 21 different senses, we actually have critical windows where they lock. So even though I have a plastic brain that I can change my attitudes and the language that I speak and the sort of car that I drive, things like senses lock. So my vision isn't very plastic. It might degrade, but, you know, my vision locks, my hearing locks, so I can distinguish, it isn't just all white noise, I can distinguish different sounds. So these windows tend to lock before three. Now, here's the big question mark. What we're seeing, and I don't have an answer for this, is the rise in autism, and part of the, re it's not food additives, and it's not immunisation, um, 
part of the research now is looking at the impact of radiation, electromagnetic radiation on the brains of little babies. Now, and now we're bathed in it all the time now. So the research is ongoing and the jury's out, but the big one for that for brain development is what are these digital devices actually doing organically? What are they actually doing biologically to little brains? So I think it's a good practice that kids under two, under three, don't play with phones, don't play with digital devices, don't have um, wireless devices in their cots, in their prams. It's great babysitting, but even um, the Australian government, their recommendation as well, because of the research that they're looking at is kids under that age shouldn't have it. And that for kids between about two to five-ish one-hour screen time a day, now, we live by screens, TV, iPad, phone, games. And for, say, 5 to 18, guess how many hours screen time the Australian government recommends? Two hours. Now, apart from the essential stuff, because all of our homework, all of our work, like all, of my, all my report writing's on computer. So we need to limit that because the jury's out about the impact it's having biologically as well as socially. Here's the other problem apart from the neurology. This is for teenagers. So those cycles that I was talking about, now when we come into adolescence, our brain tends to grow from the back to the front, from the bottom up. So the last bit of our brain is this prefrontal cortex. So we'll see that our kids, they have knowledge, they know stuff, and they'll know more about the internet and computers than we will, but they don't have the wisdom to go with it. Because one of the last things that develops is their ability for um, long-term thinking and impulse control and safety. One of my daughters for her 21st, she wanted to jump out of an aeroplane and she thought it was amazing and then she was bungee jumping in New Zealand with a girlfriend until it was only a couple of years later. It was, I don't know why I did that, I'll never do that again. I could have died. Suddenly I went, oh, your brain wired up. <laughs> it happened. And brains finish wiring up about 24 to 26. So our teens, poor planning, poor judgment, poor impulse control. They really need our guidance when it comes to the internet because they're going to be impulsive and take risks and not even realise it's risks. And they're going to feel like they know everything. And what do we know? You know, I used to have a dial-up phone when I was a kid. Like my, yeah, my children think it's hilarious. Did you have TVs, Mum? So our kids need us because they don't know what they don't know. And their boundaries are very poor. What happens in adolescence, we used to think it was all because of hormones um, for our daughters. You know, they're getting their periods or watch out, she's in a bad mood. Um, but our, our peer pressure and hormones don't seem to be new research. Well, it's not that new anymore. But research is saying it's much more to do with this. In the cycles, we get a proliferation of connections and then... We, it dies off what we don't need. And then in the next cycle, a proliferation of connections. And then it dies off what we don't need. So in adolescence, we have a proliferation of connection. And then the, the, the front of the brain literally is melting. <laughs> Some, as part of these connections are dying off. And our kids, sometimes they're there, but the lights are on, but nobody's home. We went through that. So how was your day? Yeah, fine. And that's really all they could think of. So they're going through a change in their neurological development. And it happened to all of us. So in teen years, don't just go, oh, well, they're in high school now. Oh, we've laid the foundation. We can trust them. We'll be those permissive parents. We can trust them. And if they make a mistake, they'll learn. More than ever, our little kids need us, our teens need us. We actually need to not drop the ball at all with um, the internet with our kids. So, yes... Adolescence, this classically is these four areas. So we need to be providing environments where they can achieve this stuff. They're novelty seeking. So they need new things. Give them new experiences. Take them to the old person's home. Help them to build a vegetable garden. 
um, let's get them involved in leadership at school and out of school so that the novelty seeking isn't going to take them into dangerous things on the internet. Social engagements. Our kids want to separate a bit more from us. That's normal and healthy because they're getting to ready to launch into life. So the internet provides this amazing place because they have a hunger for peer connection at this age. They have increased emotional intensity. So they actually like all the angst, like that show um, Slender Man, that cyber false reality place. Um, and it's why they're so easily groomed, why they're so easily led astray, because we wouldn't understand how passionate life is. And they need creative exploration. So they want to learn and know new things, so let's guide them in that. That's the four things that our teens are going to do anyway. Um, that's part of what's happening inside their brains. We need to walk with them in that, not just trust that they know how to navigate this. So, oh, and I've talked to you about what's electromagnetic radiation doing to my brain. That's all of us as well. That's our brains as well. It's impacting us, not good for us. Then mental health. Mental health is a very big one. Um, I learned FOMO in the Christmas holidays. Um, fear of missing out. My kids were away, oh, they're all adults now, but we were away on holidays and they're checking their Facebook, messaging, and what are you all doing? And they're going, FOMO, FOMO. Fear of missing out, which is why check, 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 check. So our kids, so much of their identity and reality is on the internet. This thing, um, Facebook depression, compare and despair. My life is not as good as other people. A lot of very vulnerable people, socially isolated, find the internet. Um, it's a platform where they can matter. It's a platform when they can create a fake profile. It's a platform where they can get likes if they're clever enough, smart enough, nasty enough. So we have this, um, the decreased self-esteem because we're not being able to connect well in real time and real place. As well, we're seeing the drop in empathy. I'm seeing a lot of people who are losing their ability for social connection because from a young age now, kids are learning through digital media, but they're not socially working out the nuances of conversation and when to wait for someone else's turn and working out um, play and activity and balance and coordination. So they can be very awkward and shut down um, and it's much easier to flick on Facebook. Sometimes I come into my waiting room at work, everyone at every age is there swiping their phones. <laughs> And that's, no one's talking to anyone because everyone's glued because it's safe. And so I don't need to be trying to connect and dealing with real-time rejection. Oh, and fubbing, we know what fubbing is. I'm snubbing you with my phone, so phone snubbing. So it's people at restaurants, people on, and hopefully nobody here has phones at the dinner table because your kids will fub you and don't fub your kids. Don't be there looking at the internet as a way of snubbing or ignoring somebody else. And you're not even doing it on purpose, but people get lost. My kids will just get lost in this other world. Well, when they were younger, now, well, they know not to do it because I won't have phones at the dinner table. Okay, so digital families. How do we manage this? We need to stay connected, be interested, know what your kids are looking at. That's the big challenge, contact. You need to know what sites your kids are looking at, what their profiles are. You need to know what all their passwords are. You need to talk to them about digital issues. They need to know what sexting is. They need to know what grooming is. They need to know what cyber stalking is. They need to know what trolling is. They need to know who to talk to if something's happening. They need to know what it means to be a bystander and how that's not a helpful thing to do. They need to understand their digital reputation. They need to understand the shelf life. We need to be teaching our kids all of these things, not assuming that they know it. All kids need self-regulating. Brains don't finish developing till 24, 26. All kids, no matter how smart, clever, honest, trustworthy, sometimes we need help self-regulating. Sometimes we stay up too long, eat too much, maybe have one too many glasses of wine, go over the speed limit. Everybody needs help, but particularly our kids need help self-regulating. How do we do that? By not, by not letting go of their hand. It's a lot harder if you let them go for five years thinking that they'll manage this and now their behaviour is out of control. To rein that in is hard work. It's 
not impossible, but it's hard. So let's stay connected and walk through the digital world with our kids. Um, we need to encourage offline activities. The Australian government, all of us, every person in this room, needs to have 60 minutes of aerobic activity every day. Some people will say, does walking from my desk to the door count? Well, yes, it probably does, but we need to have something that elevates heartbeat because we're becoming such a sedentary culture. So we need to be encouraging our children to be doing physical activity every day, even if it means that you're going walking with them. Oh, that's the website that the Australian Government Health talks about, um, what's healthy exercise and screen time. Digital nutrition, we need to help our kids know how to use the internet for good, not for evil. What are the good sites? What are the healthy sites? How do we set up files and folders and, and how do we investigate things that are good and valuable and challenging and positive for us? And sometimes with our young people, I think it's really valuable to draw up a contract. And I think the Australian, the eSafety website has got some samples of contracts that you can draw up, which is um, where devices stay overnight, how long people are committing to be online for, and set it up together as a family. Because some of the questions, what happens on holidays, what happens on weekends, what happens over Christmas when they don't have homework, or well, except if they're in year 12. So we need the strategies. We need to set an example. We need to lead the way by putting our devices down. And we have to have device-free times where there is no, there's no media going on. For me, I had to do some catch-up because I don't like TV. So I wasn't someone when the internet and Facebook came on, on that I was, oh, I have to get the latest iPhone because I've never been interested in TV. So I had, I've really had to work hard to stay up with this and that's the challenge. There is no choice. You need to know the apps that your kids are using, the programs that your kids are using. You need to look at the reviews. You need to get on board with it so that you can guide your kids whether or not these things are safe. And it was a struggle for me because I'm not particularly interested, but I'm interested in my kids. And so I had to learn. Bedrooms, I've already said that. Um, one of my clients <laughs> lent me... Um, I forget what it, what it actually is called, but it measures um, levels of electromagnetic radiation around the house. And um, she put my phone by my bedside table and it just went off the Richter scale. So that was really good visual evidence for me that, no, because my bedside, bedside table is usually next to our head, <laughs> so I don't have my phone there anymore. So we need to work out what's reasonable time limits for um, holidays and weekends. And kids were so oh, pleased, just two hours? Two hours. Bzzz. I don't know that that's healthy for our kids, but we need to negotiate what's fair and reasonable so long as there's digital free times. And we need to do the digital detox. All of us have a day or a weekend with no device. If you can't do that, then you're on the sensitised side of addiction. So that's possibly a useful thing to do is see if you can go for a day or two without any digital, any social media, any wireless, no TV, iPad, etc. Now some of us would say, yeah, of course I can do that. I could do that, but I just like using my devices. But I could do it if I wanted to. Sometimes we need to detox from it. Um, and we need to know our kids' real life friends and their online friends, because often they're different people. Or in amongst their online friends is their girlfriends, cousins, next door neighbours, best friend. And now he's in that social group commenting, which is how the young girl who ended up um, disappearing, that's how that happened. So we need to know their technology. We're almost done. If, now these are some of the lessons we need to give our kids. If you wouldn't say it or do it face to face, don't go doing it or saying it online. If you wouldn't do it face to face, don't do it online because the whole world is watching. Everyone can tap in potentially. Educate early and often. So as soon as your kids are using any devices, they need to understand about um, safety and firewalls and passwords. We need to be educating our kids because they're not born knowing it and technology is ramping up. They need to know to regularly change their passwords. They need to know not to open those emails that have popped into their account from someone they don't know. They need to know that that can put a virus in the computer. 
So we need to be talking to our kids as soon as they're starting to use devices because sometimes Trojans can come in. You don't want your five-year-old suddenly opening the computer and there's a hardcore sex scene playing. So we need to protect our kids, give them education and understanding about what to do when stuff happens on the internet. Teach them to beware of strangers bearing gifts. That's our grooming stuff. And I think kids shouldn't browse unaccompanied. So even if our kids are having to do a project, an assessment task at school, I think our primary school kids should not be browsing. They can browse and you're sitting there watching. And don't get trapped into that thing of I trust my kids. Because I do trust my kids, it's the other people I don't trust. So young children shouldn't be browsing on their own. Um, be vigilant, monitor what you can. And install some safety apps, things like Net Nanny and Norton Family. Um, there's a few different ones where you can actually, um, all of their emails that come into their account can come into your account. You can have firewalls in place. There are some good programs out there, but the older our young people get, the better they are at, at dismantling those and going around them, which is why we need to be on board when they're young. And finishing off with the three C's of resilient, diligent, digital citizens. Contact. Know who they're talking to um, and you stay in touch with them. I think that's really important. Content. What are they looking at? What are you teaching them? What are you giving them as valuable content? content? And the last one, conduct. Your behaviour matters the most in this. Your behaviour, you being on board, you training them up, you keeping them safe, you giving them education, you monitoring, you putting all of the, the safety in place. So it isn't just teaching our kids these three things. We need to live them and apply it because it's actually a wonderful medium and a really scary one as well. And the last one is just the slides, um, the websites that you have. And I've gone through quite a few of them. The e-safety one will actually, you can print a, a copy of, um, it's a government booklet that's got some really useful information in it. This is the first website. The second one, Think You Know, is set up in conjunction with um, Federal Police. Um, cyber Safety and Security Guide for you and your family. You can download this as well. It's a really good guide as well. The thing that I like about these, it gives us contact information. There's, some of the sites have got training videos, they've got demonstrations, there's tools, there's recommendations that you can look at and you can look at with your children. And I think that keeps everybody safer. Information is very valuable. Okay, we need... I'll stop there. Are there any questions?